Okay. Good evening again, and I would like to welcome you guys to the August 6, 2020 Community of the Whole virtual meeting. Um, before we get started, I will read the no notice and instructions related to our COVID-19 public comment. The notice is in reference to the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board certification pursuant to Act 302 of the 2020 regular session regarding board member participation by telephone or video conference as it relates to the school board meetings. Please be advised that due to the public health caused by the coronavirus disease 2019 and Act 302, the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board may, for the duration of this emergency, conduct board meetings and committee meetings electronically via telephone and or video conference. The committee of the whole scheduled August 6, 2020, immediately following the special meeting will be streamed live via Microsoft Teams events. A link to watch this can be found on board docs located on the school board's website. A period for written public comment will be provided before the meeting as well as before each action is taken by the board on an action item. Individuals wishing to make a public comment about any of the posted actions will need to click on the agenda item in board docs and submit via the highlighted public comment hyperlink on the agenda item details. Upon the closing of the comments, board president, board vice president today will read the public comments into the uh, record as they have been submitted. Um, without any further ado, of no intent, Madam Secretary, would you please conduct the roll call? District 7, Pres President Godet. Here. District 3, Vice President Howard. Present. District 1, Mr. Blue. Here. District 2, Mr. Lannis. Present. District 4, Ms. Collins. Present. District 5, Ms. Ware Jackson. Here. <coughs> District 6, Ms. Dyson. Present. District 8, Ms. Bernard. Present. District 9, Mr. Tatman. Present. Thank you. We have a quorum. And just an FYI, we are relying on our prior from the, our prayer from the special meeting to continue. Um, the first up item for information only is an update from our new superintendent, Ms. Brown. Welcome to our meeting, and we would like to hear our first update from you. Just taking a second for my click to uh, to activate on my little bar. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and good evening, everyone. I do have a few updates for you that I think are very exciting and um, some, some just great news overall. It's just a pleasure to be with you all for our first uh, Committee of the Whole and to be as the superintendent of this great school system. I've learned a lot in a very short period of time. A great thing happened today as we launched the Tech Ready Challenge on social media. Uh, so this is something really, really exciting that we're doing. Over the past few weeks, we have spent a significant amount of time communicating with uh, the larger community. Uh, we've sent surveys, we've called parents and homes uh, individually, text message, uh, we've used social media reminders, we've done radio pieces, and of course you've seen quite a bit um, on, uh, on TV lately about how we are working on our COVID-19 uh, plan. The challenge is, of course, making sure that we reach all of our parents. So we recognize that some of our fa families may not be connected in traditional ways. So we have actually started this um, awesome opportunity to use social media as a way to make sure that we connect with everybody. So we are asking our, our families, our employees, we actually already started with our employees today to uh, take this challenge on with us and to go viral across East Baton Rouge um, Parish Schools. So I'm asking everybody out there in cyber world, virtual world, to actually take a selfie of uh, themselves getting ready and being prepared for uh, the school year ahead. Uh, we'd like you to tag uh, your EBR friends, your EBR families, and, and then use the hashtag uh, Tech Ready Challenge. So um, as we're kind of doing this, um, we could take our little phones out and take a little picture of us uh, by our Chromebook. And the more information on how we are providing, um, you know, uh, how we're getting to the families is actually on our website. But what we'd like to do is use this social media challenge and add the hashtag, hashtag tech ready challenge so that everybody will be getting the information and that hashtag will be able to provide uh, connection to all of the information of actually calling their schools to make sure that the schools know 
if they have their devices and their connectivity. Um, we have a lot of data that we have collected, but we're trying very hard through the social media piece to actually be able to reach out a little bit more. So as soon as that parent contacts the school, we can take care of them. That is our goal through the social media. Um, I think the kids will be better at this than us, so hopefully they will be um, hashtagging and sending uh, the, uh, the Tech Ready Challenge to all of their friends, and we'll be able to get uh, some more input on the devices as well as um, the um, access. So I'd like to tell you that um, we've had a great first week of Teachers Back. Um, that was one of the things that Cabinet truly made the commitment to of going out to the actual schools. Um, so we have been out all across the district, uh, really supporting the teachers and the administ administration of the schools. Um, I know myself as, long, as well as uh, Ms. Collins, we were out at uh, Park Forest Elementary School for their distribution. Um, it was phenomenal. Uh, parents were lined up ready for their um, devices as well as their little plastic clear backpacks for their schedules, for um, anything that they needed. And those faces of those parents and those children in those cars that came by were just gorgeous, just fabulous. So happy, so happy to see their um, their teachers, their staff members, um, and actually get something from the school district. I think one of the things that families feel is that sometimes they don't see what's in the classroom, but we're actually taking the classroom and giving it to them during this di device distribution. Um, and it almost feels like, like a gift, even though it is really their education we're handing to them. So I just wanted to share that. I also was able to visit a few more schools during the week. Um, I visited Parkview Elementary School, just a fabulous little school, a spit shine clean, got my temperature taken, all the protocols were followed, uh, and going through the rooms and seeing the teachers actually in their virtual environment, working, taking their professional development, participating in those team meetings. It was just delicious to see everybody doing all of that great work and getting ready. I visited uh, Sherwood Middle uh, Magnet. I had a great opportunity there. Um, just again, the uh, EdTech Blitz week where we had a significant amount of professional development more in the mechanics because we did a lot of content work over the summer. Um, it was just wonderful to see um, the teachers there highly engaged, um, working with administration through meetings and absolutely learning from each other in, uh, in the new virtual um, environment. I also went to Audubon Elementary School. So if you think my list is kind of long, you're going to see the same thing from every single cabinet member that we actually spent time. If, if we are um, the administrators of the district, we are a part of making sure that those schools have what they need. Um, and different things came up that we absolutely were able to uh, take a look at right away um, and get those ch any challenges fixed right away. Uh, but for the most part, I can tell you these schools are just ready and able to get to the children on Monday morning. My final school was Broadmoor High School. I can tell you, Mr. Bradford, I just want to package him up and, and, just, um, and just share him. He was so excited about uh, all of the meetings, all of the uh, team meetings. I actually got to participate in some of them, all the department meetings that he was holding. Um, it, was, it was really fabulous. The school looked great, all of the power washing, all of the lawn maintenance, everything was just spit shine clean. And um, having an opportunity to participate in some of those team meetings with staff was great. So the other next thing that I'd just like to share with you for a quick second is staff has been working really hard throughout the summer uh, to help our teachers in the virtual environment. First of all, um, we had our um, a Strong Start program during the month of July. Uh, we had over 4,000 students participate in that, um, in that um, Smart Start, Strong Start program. Um, we actually had uh, students, really it was during the two middle weeks where we had the most engagement um, from the students. But I really, really felt strongly that the teachers learned as much as the students did during that time frame. A very, very good opportunity for children to get ELA and math additional support uh, during that month of July through that Smart Start program. Um, also, 
We also had a significant amount of professional development over the summer. We actually had over 4,500 courses that were taken over the summer by teachers in very specific content areas. So they were actually learning all summer long of all of the tools and techniques to get in there virtually with the children. Um, there's a full there's a full uh, list of all of the sessions on the PD um, professional development technology integration and professional development page. Um, and the other piece that I think is really great is all those sessions have been recorded. So teachers can get just in time training by going into that um, into that website and find the different courses that were offered over the summer and be able to take them again or take them for the first time. So I shared a little bit about this EdTech Blitz that we had this week. Which it included presentations on the Google Classroom, you know, Nearpod also has our emotion, social emotional um, learning components in it. Um, we had it for the littles as Nearpod likes to call it, and we also had it for three through five as well as middle school and high school. Best practices for online learning for the elementary, middle and high school, and also Google Classroom, Google Meet, and many, many more opportunities during this week for teachers to learn. Um, we actually had over 900 teachers participating in each of those sessions. So when we talk about the power of being able to get professional development and information out, um, it was really a, it was really um, an amazing week of opportunities for teachers. So we've had some great accomplishments that I just want to take a quick second on is uh, recently 258 Baton Rouge Magnet students were named uh, 2019 AP Scholars. We should be getting some additional information coming out soon for the spring session, but I just wanted to share with you um, that in order to be an AP scholar, uh, these students must score a, a score of three or higher on their AP exams, and they actually have to score that on at least three exams in order to be an AP scholar. So that's that's pretty significant. We actually had 40 students that um, earned the distinction of being named national AP merit scholars because they actually earned a score of four or higher on eight or more of the AP exams. So we expect more data to be coming in uh, from the spring session. Um, and then we also had uh, about 109 additional students were named with AP Scholars of Distinction. So, um, so the district is really, really rising in the participation in advanced placement courses, as well as the scores in advanced placement courses. And I think that's something that, um, that this board should truly be very, very proud of. And finally, I just wanna end my report on a really fun note. Um, you know, the virtual environment um, is, um, is opening great, great new worlds uh, to our teachers and our students. Um, so there's a virtual event happening at one of our schools. Uh, Twin Oaks uh, Elementary is participating in a mentorship program called The Shift. So you can imagine with, uh, with the world of sports um, really wanting to uh, shift things, um, we have Tyron Matthew, a former LSU and current NFL superstar, um, is going to be meeting with those students at Twin Oaks Elementary School every couple of weeks to provide them with some really awesome inspirational messages. So we're looking forward to being able to kind of pipe in uh, some, some great superstars and some great mentors and examples of, uh, of pillars of our community into schools. So we're really excited about that. So thank you all. Um, I look forward to the rest of the meeting and thank you for letting me share that report with you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Um, uh, there are no questions related to the report. Um, well, I see the, well, actually there is a request to speak from Ms. Ware Jackson. So Ms. Ware Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> thank great you, Ms. Jackson. Um, I had a, a couple of questions, though, uh, just related to the, the opening of schools and and uh, some of our little hurdles that we're having to uh, jump across. Uh, I've gotten some questions specifically around um, some some partnerships. Um, yes. Do you know whether or not and maybe Mr. Shamlin can chime in on this, you know, with that situation with the YMCA? Uh, not being able to to help some of our parents that uh, that are not able to um, have their kids in school and get some help with the virtual learning process. I know that's not um, particularly a local hurdle, but I know that's that's one that's I guess on the state level. And I'm wondering if there's anything that we can do locally 
that would help um, move some of this out of the way, some of the hurdles out of the way so that we can get some more help with um, some assistance with some of the parents that, that need some help. Do you have any thoughts on that? So, so we did um, also get some communication uh, from the YMCA and we also reached out to um, other organizations, um, you know, to see how uh, they were, you know, looking at this. Um, in reaching out to the state, um, they, the state actually uh, was not able to shift uh, their position on this. Um, the child care licensing is the issue. Um, is I believe uh, Mr. Shanley can help here um, if I get it wrong, uh, but the child care licensing issue uh, really um, is, is, the, is the challenge for the YMCA and a couple of other of our organizations. Um, it is not impossible, it just takes a little time to get that done. Um, I think the state's position is that um, without having that, and it's, it's not our partners that are the problem, uh, but I believe the state is um, cautious about releasing that because then anybody could be opening a child care program without licensing and perhaps putting students at risk. So um, the organizations are expected to go through the process of the child care licensing. Um, and remember, our partners um, like the YMCA, um, they are only able currently uh, with the state, they are only able to provide um, aftercare in summer camps and I, for school age children. And I think when it starts to trickle down earlier into the school day, it becomes a child care licensing issue. So, um, Mr. Shamlin, if there's anything I missed. so. No, ma'am, I think you covered it, but essentially there's a licensing process uh, that the Y would have to go through. Um, Superintendent Brown and I spoke, I think, at the local level, um, I think expressing support for the Y and other agencies like the Y um, to the state level offices um, and maybe supporting the process of waiving that license, which can happen. But it, again, it's a process that the Y and others would have to go through would be the best route to go. And I know that our district has already done that. We've already expressed officially support for that. Mm -hmm. Good. That's good information uh, that we can get out to some folks. I know there's a lot of questions around that and, and around transportation for uh, helping to deliver some of the meals, um, you know, we have a lot of people that don't have transportation and I understand that um, the meals need to be picked up uh, and not delivered. Um, I guess we're, we're looking at some other ways that we can get um, get these meals out and uh, and then some of our kids who's who don't have transportation to even pick up their um, their Chromebooks and and all that. Uh, I know we're we're working on some of those as well. Um, do you have any any more information around those challenges? Uh, yes, um, actually uh, we've been working. Uh, Dr. Mann has just been fabulous in figuring out all different ways uh, to support, uh, you know, food and child nutrition. Um, one of the challenges is, um, you know, with for the first two weeks uh, we have planned, you know, hot meals. So we wanted to make sure that uh, children had the opportunity to have hot meals. So that's why the first two weeks are done as a pickup. Um, after that, we will be looking at opportunities or more uh, shelf stable um, food to be going home. And once that, it's probably in, in two weeks or a little bit more, once that shelf stable food is, is ready and we can actually start working with our trans transportation department to be able to get that delivered. So we've got a little flux time here um, and um, Dr. Mann has uh, created an awesome way for families with a QAR code to be able to um, scan and be able to uh, pick up their uh, meals. So uh, she is working really, really hard to work through all of those challenges. And we do expect in the near future for the buses to be able to help us get those foods out to the, that uh, shelf, shelf stable food out to the communities. For, for longer periods of time than just picking up for a day. Okay. Great, and, and the situation with the Chromebooks and transportation? 
Yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, that we have been doing uh, during the during the food pickup time is um, we actually are using those times to actually get everything out to the families at once. We've not. Um, the challenge is is we have got to again. That's why our 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 tech ready challenge came about is as soon as we can get a little more information about the students that do not have those devices and that's going to show up on the first day of school. So, um, you know, parents may may not be able to respond right now, but on that first day of school or second day of school, um, that's when we will truly see the numbers and we will be able to push those things out um, every which way to make sure that those families have those devices. Okay, okay. thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lord Jackson. Next in the queue is Ms. Dyson. While we're on the subject of the meal distribution, um, I just wanted to ask if I, I've been getting feedback that the parents aren't going to be able to get the kids into the car and go wait in a line and they only have like under 30 minutes for the lunch break and get back to the computers to be in class again. Um, so I have been asked two things. Would we consider possibly doing a evening four to six or something the night prior and then, you know, they would reheat um, so that they could try to juggle it in that under 30 minutes. The other thing that I've heard a lot and been requested to ask is um, rather than the huge cans of pineapple and, and those kind of things, they found it more helpful when they had a card that had the limited items that could be purchased, bread, milk, peanut butter, eggs, those kinds of things with it. Um, and they found that would be more helpful than these long shelf life things that they may not even like yeah. or need. So I don't know if that's been considered or could be reconsidered. Um, they really liked those cards and be able to buy the kind of things that their children would eat and knowing that those cards are restricted on certain type purchases. Sure, I appreciate that, Ms. Dyson, very much. I know that the Food Service Department has been discussing that and looking into that. Um, so that is something that we can uh, take a look at and follow up on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your work on this. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, the board is now clear. Are there any more questions or concerns from board members? Seeing none, we will move to our next item for consideration. Our next item for consideration is D1. It is entitled Grants. It is a consideration of a request for the approval of Cox Charities Innovation and in Education Grant in the amount of $12,688 to provide di direct service classroom projects. At this time, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. So so moved by Mr. Godet, and I think I saw Ms. Dyson's hand, um, seconded by Ms. Dyson. Are there any questions or concerns from the board? All right, I see none. We will move over to the audience. I will refresh the comments. Um, seeing no comments from the audience, I will go back to the board. All right, I see no None in the queue. Um, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue. Yes. Mr. Lannis. Yes. Mr. Howard. Yes. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins. <laughs> Ms. Ware Jackson? Yes. Ms. Dyson? Yes. Mr. Godet? Yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Mr. Tatman? Yes. Mr. Tatman, can you click on your button? It, it, it came up. I, I touched it 20 times. It won't. Okay. It's frozen, so. I will mark you as yes. Ms. Collins? 
Yay. Thank you. <laughs> the motion carries. Thank you. Our next item for consideration is item D2. It is entitled budgets. It is a consideration of a request for the approval of the following budgets. The Strong Start Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund in the amount of $765,000. Um, the recommended action, uh, excuse me, uh -huh. and then the second item is the 2020-2021 Believe and Prepare Formula Transition Budget in the amount of $5,000. Um, this is brought by Mr. Ms. A Mr. Adam Smith and Ms. Sandra Bethley. At this time, I'll entertain a motion. I can't see everyone's screen, so if you can put your moves into the box, that would be great. I see Mr. Dyson's hand. I'll entertain a second. I'll move second. Second by Mr. Tadman. Are there any questions, thoughts, or concerns from the board? All right, seeing none, I'll go to the audience. Well, I actually do have a question. Um, Mr. Smith, um, could you just give us a, a very brief understanding of the um, the 765,000 piece of this uh, this this grant as it relates to the Strong Start? Um, is it something that we're doing with the CARES Act money or is this just something that we've already uh, considered with our Strong Start program? You yes. don't have to present the whole thing, just, a, just an understanding. Yes. 446,000 is used for connectivity. The remaining went to uh, our private and parochial schools for equitable services. And so we're using uh, the remaining that uh, the district was able to keep for buying hotspots for our students. Gotcha. And that private and parochial uh, allocation was something that we were required to do by the federal government, correct? Yes, ma'am. They have entitled to their share of the fund. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. Um, all right. All right. See, no problem. I see no additional questions um, or comments from the board. We'll move over to audience comments. I'll refresh one last time. All right. There are no um, comments from the audience. Back to the board. Are there any additional questions or comments? All right, seeing none, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue? Yes. Mr. Lannis? Yay. Mr. Howard? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yay. Ms. Ware Jackson? Yes. Ms. Dyson? Yes. Mr. Godet? Yes. Are you not, are you, can you not log in? Uh, I think get back to it. There, I got it. Ms. Bernard? I'm sorry, yes. Mr. Godet. Yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Mr. Tatman? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, just FYI, if you're not talking, if you could uh, turn off your mic and mute it, there's some background noise occasionally throughout uh, the, the vote. Thank you. Our next item for consideration is professional service contracts. It is a consideration of requests for the approval of professional service contract between the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board and the following Nearpod in the amount of $17,984 and 62 cents to provide social and emotional learning software. The funding source is Strong Start, career compass in the amount of 290,000 to provide individual college and career coaching. The funding source is Strong Start, Excel Connections LLC in the amount of 40,000 to provide coaching and professional learning. Funding source Title III, Board of Supervisors of Louisiana State University, Louisiana State University and Agriculture and Mechanical College on behalf of its Louisiana State University Health Science Center in the amount of $50,000 to provide specialized support for educators to meet the unique needs of students with disabilities. Funding source IDA, Baton Rouge Children's Advocacy Center in the amount of $40,000 to provide professional learning and support. The funding source is Strong Start. Um, school specialty in the amount of $17,153 to provide professional development and support. The funding source is School Redesign. 
The Avid Center in the amount of 65506 to provide support in professional learning, the funding source of school redesign. Illuminate Education in the amount of 123378 to provide fast bridge assessment systems, annual subscription. Illuminate Education in the amount of 20000 to provide the Horizon ACT College Readiness Package. City Year Incorporated in the amount of $180,000 to provide youth development and education support services. Um, K instruct, instructor, instructor in the amount of $32,658 to provide Canvas Cloud subscription for faculty. The funding source is technology. At this time, I entertain a motion. So moved by Ms. Ware Jackson. Second. Second, Mr. Lannis. Second by Mr. Lannis. There's also a request to speak um, by Mr. Lannis. Mr. Lannis. Yes, thank you, Vice President Howard. And uh, while I didn't get an opportunity to greet and introduce our, our new superintendent, Leslie Brown, earlier, I will say welcome to the team. And it is uh, gracious to have you and joining us in this meeting. Uh, last week, we had an opportunity to sit down and have some conversations. And I love the fact that we are utilizing our dual enrollment throughout our uh, institutions of higher education. The only thing that I will say is that when we did have some discussions, uh, something that I would love to see happen, and I think it'd be really big for our schools, more specifically our high school students, as regards entrepreneurship and uh, courses that lead to that is adding dual enrollment courses that speak to things that students also like to do, like cosmetology and uh, also barbering. We have a huge amount of students uh, that have been requesting this and it's something I would love to see happen inside of our schools because again it not only shows our students that uh, we're putting programming there that they uh, could be interested in but it also shows them that they can be entrepreneurs inside of our communities as well so thank you thank you Mr. Lannis um, there are no more questions from the board are there any additional questions or concerns from the board all right Miss Ware Jackson you're on mute, Ms. Wedger. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, a couple of us attended the um, LSBA conference um, recently, and we were made aware that our governor has put into place some funding for um, social emotional learning. And I see that, you know, a couple of these grants also, I'm, I'm sorry, not grants, contracts uh, cover that. And I'm wondering if we are taking advantage of uh, what's in place, but it's through um, ingenuity, um, and it seems we we were working with them in the past. Are we still working with ingenuity? Anybody know? Mr. Smith or Dr. Bentley? Uh Yes, yes ma'am. We okay. we are we have a one year contract with Ingenuity. Uh, actually, it's a two year contract, and we have um, paid the first invoice. Half of the invoice um, has been processed this week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, I'm wondering if uh, are are we aware that this this opportunity is here from uh, Governor Edwards? I don't know what the dollar amount is, but from what I understand, um, there there's a funding available for social emotional learning. And from what I understand, this you know this is really critical. This will really really help the district in in, in a, a lot of ways. Yes, uh, ma'am. It's actually included in the grant that you all just approved. Um, the funding is allocated for technology and for the uh, mental and health screeners. Mm -hmm. So that is the the grant that you just approved. OK, that's the one that the uh, that the governor. Yes, ma'am. For through ingenuity. Yes, ma'am, it's the. Um, I noticed that the governor's of emergency educational relief fund. It's a combination of the health screeners and devices. So those are the only two items that you can allocate funds for in this particular budget. Okay. If, if I may speak. Yes, ma'am. Miss um, Miss Dupree is actually the leader of that budget as well. Um, 
we are aware of the social emotional learning tools and ingenuity. And Ms. Brazier and Erin Bradford have just rolled out a comprehensive counseling curriculum and we're adding to it as we go. We are currently looking at the components of what's available in Edgenuity to see how we can fit it in there and help complement what we're already doing. Okay, that's great, because I see that uh, Nearpod and the uh, AVID Center both have um, social emotional learning encompassed within their uh within their contract so i just wanted to make sure we weren't leaving any any goodies on the table that we can grab up <laughs> no ma'am we're we're trying to um uh, utilize the funds oh all right one, oh, one, one more question around um city year with um with their services uh i understand that you know they're they're willing to make some adjustments to make sure that they can really um, maximize the impact of, of what their core members can bring to us, especially in the areas where we have uh, schools and, and parents in particular who would be struggling with uh, some of the distance learning. So um, I just wanted to make sure that um, we all understand that and that they're willing to make some adjustments. I don't know if y'all had conversations or not. I, I just had a sidebar conversation and just wanted to make sure that um, everybody was aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Vice President uh, Howard, may I address the city? Uh, of course. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Yes, uh, Mr. Shamlin, I've been meeting with uh, uh, Dr. Lewis, Jada Lewis, and uh, we have come to a, uh, we revamped, they revamped their service model to provide support in a virtual setting. Mm -hmm. And actually they will be working directly with our schools in an innovative network. Wonderful. <laughs> Great to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dupree. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ward Jackson. Um, Ms. Dyson, is that a new request to speak or is that old? All right, we'll take it at this time. So on the agenda for these dual enrollment um, contracts, it on E, when, with regards to LSU, it provides the funding source as Supplemental Course Academy, SCA. Are you are you on item D? Are, are you on item D? We're still on item D, Ms. Uh, Dyson. We're on item D3. We're, we're not on E yet. We're not on dual enrollment, unless you're talking about something else. Oh. I'm confused. Okay. Well, so we're still on the on uh, still three. On the, correct. And not four. Okay, I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. I'll, All right. Thanks. I will get back to you when we get to that item shortly. Um, the board is now clear for item D. We will go to public comment related to item D. Um, I will refresh the public comments to see if we have any additional comments. All right. No comments related to item D3. Um, we will go back to the board. Are there any additional questions or concerns for item D3? Professional service contracts. All right, seeing none, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue. Yes. Mr. Lannis. Yay. Mr. Howard. Yes. Ms. Collins. Yay. Ms. Blair Jackson. Yes. Ms. Dyson? Yes. Mr. Godet? Yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Yes. Mr. Tapman? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Armin. We will now move to item D4. Item D4 is the Memorandum of Understanding for Dual Enrollment. It is a consideration of request for the approval of a memorandum, memorandum of understanding between the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board and the following ULM, the University of Louisiana Monroe, to provide dual enrollment courses for 2020-2021 school year, Southern University to provide dual enrollment courses for 2020-2021 school year, BRCC to provide dual enrollment courses for the 2020-2021 school year, Southeastern Louisiana University to provide dual enrollment courses for the 2021 
school year in LSU to provide dual enrollment courses for the 2020-2021 school year. The funding source is SCA Supplemental Course Academy. I will so move, and at this time I entertain a second. I'm in. Second by Ms. Dyson, moved by myself. All right, and Ms. Dyson, we'll go to you for your question. So um, on the agenda on this item, E, LSU's dual enrollment courses for this school year, it gives the funding source, but A through D, it does not. Ms. Dice, and that's I, when they're all the same funding source, I usually just put it on the last item. So they're all the same funding source as right. far as I'm, I know when Mr. Nikes can speak to that. That is correct. SCA funding is used for dual enrollment for all schools. I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. No problem. Are there any additional questions or concerns regarding this item from the board? Ms. Ward Jackson. Ms. Ward Jackson, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, um, one Thank question. Um, I noticed that um, all of them except one is like across the district, and I, I just wondered why the uh, the first one, the dual enrollment for ULM, is just specific to uh, Liberty Magnet High School, but the others um, are across the district. Uh, yes, ma'am. Give me a second for my video to come up. Um, all of our schools have autonomy to pretty much choose any dual enrollment vendors or variety of vendors that they want to use. So in this case, actually, this is our first year that any school chose ULM. So, uh, you know, that's the vendor they went with for some of their options. And again, schools have autonomy to select whatever uh, colleges they want to use. And I've seen them kind of rotate throughout the years. They'll rotate from one college to the next, but they have their autonomy to choose who they want. Uh, the other important piece is we've never turned down a dual enrollment request. So every single seat that's requested by schools, we ensure there's funding for it. All right. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nikes. Thank you, Ms. Vera Jackson. Are there any, any additional questions from the board? Seeing now, we'll go to the audience. There is a couple of comments from the audience related to this item. The first one is from Ms. Jan Chandler. Who pays the fees for the courses? If it is the student, is there any financial aid available? How and when is information on dual enrollment opportunities provided to parents and students? Are there any statistics on past participation in dual, enro dual enrollment programs? For example, schools participate in stu students age, race, gender, which areas of stu study, withdrawal rates, average number of courses taken per student. A few years ago, sports medicine at Auctioner Health stepped up to help our public schools athletes when no one else wanted to be bothered or cared about invested, investing in the lives of our young people. Through the strong commitment of athletic trainers, I'm assuming that this may be for another item, but I'll continue to read it on this item. Um, commitment of elect trainers, physicians, and others. Auctioner Health is providing by far the greatest scope and highest quality medical care to our Paris student athletes I have ever seen over 35 years of being involved providing sports medicine care to EBR coaches and athletes. That's this the next item. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's the next item, but it's listed under here, so I'll just continue to read it and read into the record. The sports medicine staff from Auctioner Health is providing an incredible array of medical resources and personnel medical care, usually reserved for college athletes, professional athletes. I believe our community, our schools, and our student athletes deserve nothing less. They deserve the very best. So just note that that item is actually, that comment is for item D5 um, for the record. Um, Karonda Curley, um, these MOUs are purely discriminatory. These MOUs were catering mostly to the newly named Liberty High. However, I don't see any liberty in any liberty in showing a preference to one school over the other. I also noticed that we do not have any considerations mentioned in the MOUs for the children with disabilities. Why? Most of the higher learning institutions provide programs and classes for children with disabilities. I know that Scotlandville Magnet, Estruma High, Capitol High, Broadmoor High, Terra High, and Glen Oaks High were not considered. Why? Northeast High was considered for an extremely bare minimum with LSU. Why? Then, when you continue to exhibit a bias towards our schools, especially our only rural high schools, but favoritism towards Baton Rouge and Liberty Magnet, this is discrimination. This is a Civil Rights Act violation and an ADA violation. I strongly recommend and encourage you to revisit these MOUs and bring forth at the upcoming school board meeting. I do not have I did not have my allotted time frame. Um, so those are all of the comments related to um, those particular items will return back to the board. Are there any additional questions or concerns for the board from the board? Excuse me. Um, and 
Seeing none, I just want to uplift um, to the community related to dual enrollment um, that recently during the past legislative session, Governor Everett's instituted um, a dual enrollment task force um, to actually address a lot of these concerns that are not necessarily a district issue, but a statewide issue related to dual enrollment regarding to the amount of students who are participating, the demographics of those students participating in el eligibility requirements for students to participate in these programs. So there has been some seed money um, instituted by the governor to look at all of these issues. And so the dual enrollment task force, which is ran by the Board of Regents, actually is meeting monthly at this time. So that is another place where you can voice a lot of your concerns related to dual enrollment and a lot of those questions are being addressed and being answered. So just wanted to uplift that. Um, visit the Board of Regents website and they'll have more information related to the dual enrollment task force. All right, seeing no further questions or concerns from the board, uh, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue? Yes. Mr. Lannis? Yay. Mr. Howard? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yay. Ms. Ward Jackson? Yes. Ms. Dyson? Yes. Mr. Goday? Mr. Goday? Yes. yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Mr. Tatman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Armand. We will now move to our next item for consideration. Our next item for consideration is the Athletic Trainer Service Agreement with Auctioner. It is a consideration of request for the approval of the renewal of an agreement between East Baton Rouge Parish School Board and the Auctioner Clinic Foundation in the amount of $60,000 to provide athletic training services. Um, at this time, I entertain a motion. All right, so moved by Mr. Ballou and second by Ms. Ware Jackson. Um, also note that Mr. Michael Godet is recusing himself from this agenda item. Are there any questions or concerns from the board? All right, Mr. Tatman. Thank you, Vice President Howard. Um, my question is, um, if sports doesn't happen because of COVID, are we locked into the 60,000 or is it a, a spend as you use it? I, I read the agreement and it said it, it places a number of hours for each athletic trainer but the question is what if football and the other sports don't happen what what is it, it do we still pay 60 or is it an allotment based uh issue miss lynn williamson are you here to answer that question or mr Nikes? i can good evening um vice president howard president goday uh superintendent brown and members of the board Yes, it, we, we've been having football uh, conditioning this summer, volleyball, cross country, swimming, football started this week. So we are, we are practicing. So that's part of their services, attending all practices for our 10 schools and then going to games. So right now, LHSA came out with a memo yesterday saying that we start volleyball games on the 8th of September and football games on the um, 8th of October. So they currently are working the number of hours just at practices for all sports. So I'm going to I'm going to go back to the question because okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a big high school sports fan, as you know, Miss Williamson. Um, yes. What if tomorrow they decide that they're going to cancel all the sports? Because that's still a possibility based on how COVID comes. Do we pay the whole 60,000 or is it a, a pro, pro rata? Payment. I would have to ask that question to my contact at Oshner. Okay. Thank you, Thank Vice, you. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Tatman. Thank you, Ms. Williamson. Um, are there any additional questions or concerns from the audience? I mean, from the board, excuse me. All right, uh, Mr. Shamlin, do you potentially have the answer to the contract question before we move on? Yeah, I was actually looking at the contract quickly. Uh, let me turn my camera on. Sorry about that. That's okay. uh, I believe if you look at the compensation schedule in Exhibit C, um, it says that we pay for um, each professional. Uh, it's twelve thousand dollars, I believe, per professional. To answer Mr. Tatman's question, if we don't, if if the services are not needed and the professionals can't work, we don't pay. 
and that's my interpretation of the contract. So we can get clarification on that from Oshner, but it, to me, the, compensa the compensation schedule pretty much answers it. If we don't utilize the professionals, we, we there's no reason to pay them. Yeah, and if I might, um, Vice President Howard, that's fine. It's got to go before the whole board anyway. I think we can get that answer before we get to the full board meeting. Correct. Thank Correct. Thank you, Mrs. Hammond. Thank you, Attorney Shamlin. Um, Ms. Dyson. Um, I was just curious um, why these services are being offered in just some of the high schools and not all, and what the funding source is. Um, they're in 10 of our high schools because Woodlawn High has their own athletic trainer that they pay as as part of that uh, the school, but the 10 other schools uh, are seen by five athletic trainers, but I'm not sure the funding source. Ben, do you know Mr. Nikase? It should be general fund. Okay. Is, is, does that mean that the one that's providing their own is going to get that much out of the general fund as a stipend to pay for theirs? No, that staff member is on staff and receives coaching stipends, and so that supplements them to do the role of the uh, trainer. It's just the other schools don't have certified trainers on staff. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dyson. Thank you, Mr. Nikes, and thank you, Ms. Williamson. There are no more um, questions or comments from the board in the queue. We will move to the audience. I will refresh the board comments. Um, D5 is from T.S. Noble. Um, organizationally and personally, I back the work of Oxford Sports Medicine Institute. Fellowship of Christian Athletes held their summer camp in July. We had existed COVID mitigation plans that OSMI, Huxner, actually took time to look over, discuss, and help us to amend to create an excellent program in accordance to state and health guidelines. Corey Elver and Dr. Berman were able to show us how to pull off an excellent and safe pro product that was good for those of, those of us in leadership of the camp, the athletes themselves, and one that the parents were at ease with. Elver and Dr. Berman have continued to care for the outcomes of our camp even beyond what was originally asked. Beyond that, Oxnard has an excellent provider for our community, has been an excellent provider for our community as a whole in their sports medicine services from my standpoint in the world of sports. sports. And education will always be a recommendation with this group in place. As they stay committed to the growing in their craft, I am excited to announce partnering or to continue partnering with them. The next come from Allison Schwartz. Auctioner trainers are very vital to sports and EBR. They are great trainers. Jeremiah McGee, as a former high school football player, I have benefited tremendously from the Auctioner Medical Center. I suffered from an ACL reconstruction surgery my junior year. Throughout my return to the, foot, to the field, their medical staff provided me with not only therapy, but encouragement, counseling, and intangibles of it being a better player. I can say they have great impacts on of doing what's in the best interest of players. I believe that it is a necessity, necessity for Auctioner to continue their services for high school athletics based personal experience, performance, and high-level quality. Auctioner is amazing. Being a head coach with no assistance and no, excuse me, this comment is from Latoya Evans. Auctioner is amazing. Being a head coach with no assistance and no athletic trainer at the school, I cannot express how thankful I am for such a great staff at Auctioner. It is inevitable that your players get hurt, but I was put at ease with Dr. Ward and the staff I knew my athletes were in great hands. Thank you to these guys Thank you to these guys will never be enough. Your long hours and hard work do not go unnoticed and you are greatly appreciated. Thank you. Next question is from Tramel, Tr I guess Tramel Carey. <laughs> Auctioner is an amazing and careful environment. I have not just attended there once, but multiple times for various injuries. And after returning from Auctioner, I returned better than before. I received excellent care in a positive place while also meeting new and wonderful people from the doctors and PTs all the way to the custodians. Without Auctioner, I wouldn't be the bright, full young man that I am. It was, it was because of attending Auctioner and working with Derek that I told myself I would love to do this someday. And because of that, my major is of choice is kinesiology at the university I attend. Finally, having Auctioner around doing sporting events gives athletes a sense of safeness. 
The next comment is from Alaya Hill. Auction is a great place. I got hurt back in January as a former tr track athlete, and they took great care of me and got me back 100% active. Auction have great services. They make sure you are comfortable with whatever they are doing. They treat you like family there and make sure they get you back better than ever. The next comment is from Dedrick Talbert. I have been to a lot of different places for my ankle injuries, but auction has to be the best decision I have ever made. They got me back to 100% in no time and everybody in the facility worked as one big team. It was like magic how they got me back to my normal life. After I was 100%, I even, I even had a little exercise session sometimes. I really appreciate everything they did for me. It has to be the best place with the best people in the world. The next comment is from Carrie Myers. The board should not choose BROC. If the board chooses BROC, they will be taking away that, that the help that athletes need when they get injured in a game or need treatment before a game. Also, you're taking away a friend from friend from friend of mine and my team at Liberty High that has been here with us for two years and has already helped every athlete that needed it, especially me. I'm an athlete. She works with almost every day to make sure I'm good enough for a game. Without her, I would not have two championship rings. If she wasn't at the school before games, I wouldn't be playing the game I love. The next comment is from Alexis Coleman. I was a former student at Broadmoor, and through my time, we never had an athletic trainer or medical staff. In the past two years, I have seen Auctioner come into our schools and help kids in ways no one has ever before. I think it is great what Auctioner is doing for students and student athletes in the EBR area. The next comment is from Bree Hyder. Dear board members, first, thank you for your participation partnership with Auctioner the last two years. I was one of the first athletic trainers hired to help build this contract and introduce sports medicine world, not just to the community, but specifically to the public school system. Over the past two years, I have poured my heart and soul into educating the community and continuing to develop this contract. I've heard countless testimonies on how the kids felt like no one cared about them before, but now they feel important. For the past two years, I have lived for providing services the public school kids wouldn't have otherwise received. Going from being a part of a three-person brigade taking care of 10 schools to watching the approval happen to add a six person to the contract has been an incredible experience. I hope that the board votes to sign the contract with Auctioner so I can continue to work toward my dream, which is to build a sports medicine legacy in EBR. The next comment is from Emmanuel Knighton. Hey, as an athlete that went through an injury, it was great. It was a great deal of uncertainty that came towards me as of what was going to be next after surgery. I had a terrible knee injury, tearing my ACL and menses. Auctioner was right there for me from the surgeon who did the surgery to the physical therapy with me having a great recovery. Specifically being worked with on by Derek Ward, he had a great patience and made me feel very important in his eyes as a patient. And he made it the best experience for me returning to play. The next comment is from Jamichael Wilson. Hello, my name is Jamichael Wilson. I am an auction outreach athlete trainer for McKinley High School and Ballard Magnet High School, located in the East Baton Rouge Parish. Auction sports medicine team has provided East each school in East Baton Rouge Parish with diligent and effective care while maintaining professionalism and mannerism. Auction Sports Medicine team has built and continue to build the standard of sports medicine care in East Baton Rouge Parish. Our main goal is to keep athletes safe, which Auction Sports Medicine team has accomplished within the last two years. I do believe we have impacted the lives of our student athletes, coaches, athletic directors, principals, and overall the community. We will continue to set the standard and achieve goals. The next comment is from Alicia Brown. My daughter is approaching her junior year at the now Liberty High. She has a student. She has been a student athlete since her freshman year, suffering two injuries throughout the time. While I wasn't immediately available to get her to a doctor, her, her athletic trainer has always been available and at her aid. The care and concern received over the years from Bree, our trainer contracted by auctioner, has been wonderful. My daughter has been a recipient of several site therapies and treatments available, directly attending her attending to her physical concerns. Not only has our current trainer been available during athletic events but she has embodied the spirit of the now Liberty High School family, Liberty Magnet High School family. She has gone in above and beyond her assigned duties of several on several occasions, making an impact on the lives of students and families she served. While another contract may be attractive, I want to express how impactful EBR's relationship with Auctioner has been for my athlete and how the thought of losing our current trainer is frightening. The next comment is from Brandon Jones. Rupturing an Achilles tendon is a very traumatic experience in itself. I visited two other hospital facilities before being invited to auctioner and my, and my experience went unmatched. Dr. Browning, Derek Ward, and the medical staff took great care of, took care of me in ways that assured me a successful and speedy recovery. I'm excited to say that I've successfully recovered and I'm forever grateful for auctioner and its staff. The next comment is from Brandon Jones. 
Um, I just read Brandon Jones. The next comment is from Grace Yoko Cato. I'm a senior at Baton Rouge Magnet High School, one of the schools that auctioners teams up with to provide athletic training. And I'm telling that as a committee, you should renew the agreement and keep the trainers in the schools. When I became injured for my season, the trainer at my school provided information to both me and my family on what recommended what was recommended in order to keep the injury from escalating. She informed my parents in a timely manner and provided me with stretches and workouts to strengthen my legs. Because of the training available, my family was able to provide me with the resources I needed to keep me safe and could take action ASAP. By option of providing a trainer to my school, I also was able to be exposed to the physical therapy field and show interest in a kinesiology major. As an athlete, I discovered my passion for the field and how helpful a trainer can be to getting an athlete on their feet again and preventing them from worsening their condition. The next comment is from Dr. Casey Hill. Dear board members, I joined Oxygen Medicine in 2019, impressed by the substantial environment substantial environment in our community and commitment to being preeminent uh, sports medicine program in the area. While local private schools were well covered from a medical standpoint, it was a rare it was rare to find any coverage at our public schools before Auctioner took the lead. We've shown commitment to helping all athletes equally. Last fall, I covered football for Tara, Barmore, Ashwin, McKinley, and Northeast. Our doctors and trainers covered sidelines around EBR throughout the fall. We've provided free physicals to all EBR athletes at multiple dates and locations. With the entirety of Auctioner Health available, for any diagnostic test or specialty referral that may be needed, we're able to quickly evaluate and treat our athletes with the state of the art level care. Regardless of this, regardless of the school they attend or the type of insurance they have, I hope we can continue bringing the top level care to all EBR athletes, Dr. Hill. Our next comment is from Kaylin Williams. I was treated well and they helped me figure out what was wrong and how to heal myself. The next comment is from Braylon Davis. I love auction and I feel it's the best for them to stay with East Baton Rouge Parish School System. The next comment is from Spencer Perwalt. As a member of the Auctioner Sports Medicine Institute, I have the opportunity to work with many of the incredibly qualified and talented individuals that fulfill the contract in question. My coworkers and my organization as a whole have time and again shown me the commitment and dedication they have to not just the EBR community as a whole, but specifically to the schools and children they serve. The time and energy my coworkers commit to providing the best quality care that the children in the parish is irreplaceable and goes beyond just the work of a normal employee. Working in sports medicine and with young athletes, we serve more than just to tape ankles or provide ice bags. We, as athletic trainers, are a resource acting to increase the overall health and well-being of our athletes, providing a valuable amount of health education and increase in health literacy of those we interact with daily. The care and commitment of the Oxygen Medicine Sports Medicine Institute is unmatched. Tyler Gulick. As a recently hired athletic trainer with Oxford Sports Medicine Institute, I cannot, I can without a doubt say that we have the best sports medicine program in the state. We're not only a program, but a team and a family that works very efficient together. The resources that we are ha that we have are unmatched. Our athletes receive top priority when they need to see a doctor. Same day or next day policy. No turning away of athletes due to a specific type of insurance. First class facilities and equipment to serve the athlete, ortho and PT, efficient communication and cross coverage, helping other ATs with covering events. Auction has a great reputation in the community and people trust the brand. The next comment is from Tiffany Frezel. I cannot stress enough the significance of Auction Sports Medicine Institute has made in the East Baton Rouge Parish School District. Specifically in the last year, Auction saw a need of our community and stepped up to the impact positive change. Auction's prior prioritizes making good quality health care available to all despite insurance affiliation. The Oxford Sports Medicine Institute has been working tirelessly to provide the best care for your kids on their campuses. No child will be turned away or have the care of their needs delayed for any reason at Oxford Sports Medicine. From the top of the program to the bottom, each Oxford Sports Medicine team will do whatever is necessary and right to care for the student athletes and coaches of the EBR community. Even in the midst of an unprecedented pandemic, Auction was able to nearly double the size of the athletic training staff and bring in new, physician, new physicians who specialize in sports medicine care. With Auction, the best is yet to come. The next comment is from Mandy Landry. My son played high school football and soccer at which there was always a dedicated trainer from Auction available. My son tore his ACL and fractured his 
Scopia Sc- within two months. The trainer that was at these events where he was injured called each one of them. I was very impressed with the knowledge associated with the injury. For one of the injuries, my son tried to attempt a weightlifting session the day after. Because the trainer was present at both the game where the injury happened in workouts, the next morning she made sure to check his pain and range of motion before the workout. And instead of a workout, we went to the ER and was, di- and was diagnosed with exactly what she suspected. At every game after, she was present to ensure he was wrapped properly, had a trainer not been present, we may not have been never known the injury known of the injury. During both injuries and two surgeries, she was very involved. I felt very comfortable and so did my son. Thank you, Auctioner, for being dedicated to our children. The next comment is from Haley Johnson. Auction has provided coverage to the sports and EBR parish over the past two years. They have a passion for taking care of student athletes. The athletic trainers stay educated and are always looking for new, innovative ways to improve their practices. Through Auctioner, the athletic trainers are available to create a safe space for the athletes to come to talk to them about their injuries and feel heard. Auction is able to provide direct medical care post-injury for any athlete that may get injured. In addition, they strive to get next day appointments with their orthopedic physicians. As an athletic trainer through Auctioner, I have had the privilege to work alongside some very intelligent and caring athletic trainers. We are all striving to get the best possible care to these high schools. I hope that EBR contract continues and we can develop the care relationships in these schools. The next comment is from Armand Daigle. As an athletic trainer, just beginning my employment with Auctioner, the professionalism and world-class care that Auctioner offers has been something that I have always admired while working from out of state. This was the main reason I sought employment with this company and extremely fortunate to be with my current school today. The care and consideration for all of the athletes that are fortunate enough to have an Auctioner athletic training is by far the best that I have seen even while working out of state for the past four years. Speaking with our athletic trainers and working in other states, they have nowhere near the same amount of affordable access to quality healthcare professionals and the availability to the best doctors that the country has to offer. Auctioner has truly created an amazing partnership with the schools of this parish and would be a shame if the student athletes lose this extremely valuable asset to their athletic programs. The next comment is from Corey Elver. I present as someone who has spent the majority of his life in Baton Rouge. My entire life has revolved around sports and sports medicine in the city. I now find myself in a position to make differences in the community in which I was raised. That opportunity was presented by Auctioner Health. In a time where it had been de- decades since EBR public schools have received adequate athletic training services, this contract was the catalyst for bringing the state's leading hospital system to Baton Rouge in regards to sports, sports medicine, and the fruits of the relation have changed the life of all student athletes in EBR as we know it. I speak, I know, for Auctioner Health as a whole when I say we would love to continue our partnership and taking care of the student athletes in this community and hope you all feel the same way. That has been our intent from the time we arrived in Baton Rouge and will never change. Please allow, please allow us the courtesy to continue excel and excel together. Thank you for your time. The next comment is from Shelby Corincinto. Corincinto. Dear EBR board, as a coach for a local high school team, I would like to voice my concern as it pertains to the vote this evening. My experience with the Auctioner Athletic Training Program has been nothing but exceptional. They have proven to be dependable, reliable, educated, and supportive, truly providing attentive medical care for our student athletes. Our trainer has become a part of our team. There is a trust that has been established and maintained. Please give careful consideration in your vote tonight. Thank you for your consideration and time tonight. The next comment is from Philip Hawk. As a coach at Liberty Magnet, we have truly enjoyed our relationship with Auctioner and the services they provide for all student athletes. Communication, quick and easy, making sure things are handled in a timely manner. Most importantly, our trainer, Bri Heider, has invested herself as a part of the family culture we are building at Liberty. She has a passion for our school and our kids. Good people who are passionate about their work are hard to find. No reason to mess with a good thing. Stick with Auctioner. The next comment is from Dana Gilbert. Bree Hyder has been an amazing part of athletics at Liberty Magnet High School. She is very well respected by the staff as well as the students. I personally had the chance to work with her concerning a few of my players, and she went above and beyond to help them as well as keep them in the loop on what their doctor suggested. She communicates well, very well, at a time when they need her, and she works well past a normal work schedule to help anyone out. She has these kids in top priority. I hope you allow to breathe to stay with our school. She is a huge part of it. The next comment is from Joshua Pratt. 
As an auction employee who provides outreach athletic training services for one of Baton Rouge High Schools, I, as well as my fellow coworkers with similar job responsibilities, strive to maintain the core values of auctioners. Our number one priority is the health and welfare of our patients. Through the expansion of athletic training services that auctioner has been able to provide throughout Baton Rouge, auctioner has created a vast network that strives to provide the best health care and student athletes. We achieve this through acting with integrity, striving to always provide excellent medical care, treating every encounter with compassion, and working as a team, even among the different high schools, to help ensure that the best overall care is rendered. The next comment is from Jeremy Burnham. As a nonprofit organization, Auctioner makes a commitment to our community to provide high value care that is accessible to all patients. We believe that every patient should be provided the same level of service, regardless of insurance type, socioeconomic status, race, age, or gender. Two years ago, Auctioner identified a health care disparity in Baton Rouge. Providing athletic training services to an underserved community has been one of the only one of the has been, excuse me, only one of the ways in which we've honored our commitment to address disparity and provide meaningful, impactful, and patient-centered change. Thank you for the opportunity to care for your student athletes. I want to reaffirm our commitments to constant improvement, teamwork, and a patient-first mentality. The next comment is from Tiffany Buchan. Auction Health System was the first health system in Baton Rouge region to take into consideration the serious lack of comprehensive medical care for student athletes and to form a program to address those needs. Auction was proud to have EBR Parish Athletics as our primary contact. In the time that I have worked for Auctioner as a certified ATC, as well as lead ATC for this region, I have nothing but positive feedback from coaches, athletic directors, and parents about our program. Auction Health System's core values are patients first, compassion, integrity, excellence, and teamwork. Auction and Sports Medicine program physicians have put patients first by seeing EBR athletes regardless of insurance or money concerns. They have seen patients on sidelines, Saturday clinics, and same-day appointments to ensure proper and care for the first hours after injury. The athletic trainers employed by Auction that serve EBR consistently display compassion, integrity, excellence, and teamwork while being provided while providing care for athletes. They have constantly advocated for more athletic trainers, which Auctioner has provided. ATCs have developed connections with athletes, which allows them to feel more comfortable sharing about their injuries, other health concerns, as well as financial concerns. ATCs have created spaces for treatments, implemented emergency action plans, educated athletes on health concerns, and been a constant presence on campus that, comes, that coaches and parents have come to trust. Those ATCs are in frequent contact with one another to ensure that all needs across the parish are staffed not just their own schools. Auction staff has frequent meetings with EBR athletic directors to discuss ways that we can better serve them. I believe that in the past two years, Auction's athletic health has been an incredible partner to the East Baton Rouge Parish school system, and it is in our hand, it is our hope that we will be able to continue to pursue the goals of the create the safest playing environment for your children. And that concludes the comments on this item. We will now return to the board for additional questions or comments. Um, Ms. Bernard. It's Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Bernard, it's Mr. Lannis first. Oh, I'm, I didn't I realize I had been reading so long. Mr. Lannis. <laughs> no problem, Vice President Howard, and I won't be long. I think that I follow the sentiments of everybody that commented tonight about Ashner. Yes, Ashner is an excellent service. I have been to quite a few uh, sporting events from basketball, football, baseball, volleyball, and they do provide uh, excellent service. And I just want to say thank you to them. And obviously, thank you to Derek. I don't know who you are, Derek. You are an excellent trainer because several people have mentioned your name and the excellent work that you have done. So continue to good work. Thank you, Ms. Alanis. Uh, Mr. Shamler. Uh, yes, just speaking to the earlier question raised by Mr. Tatman, we did get confirmation from an Ashna rep that they agree with my interpretation of the contract, but we will revisit the language to be sure. Um, and I'll let the board know something at the regular meeting of the, the board in two weeks. Thank you, Mr. Shamlin. Mr. Tapman. Thank you, Vice President Howard. Um, just for all full disclosure, I was born in Oshner, and so I guess I'm part of the family. Um, but, I've, but of course, I think there's a lot of great athletic trainers all across the state and city and a lot of great doctors and all that sort of stuff. I'm actually, this is not about Oshner, this is about the contract itself. So now with all of those comments and Ms., with Ms. Williams' comments, I have a question to Mr. Shamlin, and that is, if all these services are already being provided, what are we, what are we voting on? 
I mean, Miss Miss Williamson said she said these they're you know doing spring training they're doing and they're already being provided. When I asked the question about this agenda item, and so I guess my question is: Is this a is it already in place and we're just you know I don't know. I, I help me. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Ms. Williamson speak to the specifics of implementation, but it's my understanding this contract comes up annually for review and for reapproval by the board. Okay, so, so this is so her this, comment, this, yeah, her comments that the services under the contract were already being provided on the $60,000 contract. Different contract, right? I'm sorry, you broke up on me. Say it one more time. That's so the services. So we're, so we're we're talking about this contract, the one that's on the agenda. And when when I asked the question about whether or not if the services weren't provided, the services are already. Needed. I'm talking about this contract, not any contract that's in place. It is is the services being provided on the contract we're discussing, or is it a previous contract? Yeah, it's my understanding that perhaps the services that she's discussing are coming from the previous contract in place. This takes us into the, the coming year. Um, and, and so as I read the contract, this is for the coming year and services going into the new school year. So Mr. Shaman, I'm going to ask as we move forward, um, are there any other restrictions in the contact on the contract that you are aware of relative to exclusivity, say for advertising, uh, any things like that? Yeah, there is some exclusivity in the contract um, with regard to advertising, uh, and it requires us to limit that to Oshner in certain situations. Did you have a concern about that? Well, so if somebody wants to buy a sign in an outfield and they're a orthopedic surgeon or they're um, another athletic trainer, now the athletic program can't get those dollars because it's exclusive. So we're paying them to be exclusive? Well, my my reading of the contract is that we are exclusive with them in terms of the services they are providing to us, not advertising. Oh, again, so, I, so, so you you feel confident because when I asked the question, the first answer was there were limitations in advertising. Tell me, explain that, walk that through me because I thought you said there was. So no, and, and well, I was this, mistaken. This is my fault. I should have I should have really I didn't realize this was going to be anything. I, I really it was not. I didn't even have it highlighted. I did not read the contract. I will. But when uh, with all of the comments that were made and then the other comments Miss Williamson made, it, it has raised my awareness of it. Not nothing against Oshner. Let me be very clear. Um, I go to Oshner for some of my health care, uh, but I but the the I, I'm more I'm a board member. I have a fiduciary responsibility this this district and I just want to I want to understand the contract. Not right. not Oshner, they're great. I know they do great work. They've worked on me and I'm hard to work on, but but I want to make sure this is a good deal for East Baton Rouge Parish School System. Right. So this is my reading of the exclusivity provision. It requires us to allow them to hang banners and promotional materials um, for Oshner. It doesn't prohibit other okay. similar companies, but it's exclusive as to the services provided. So we can't go seek athletic training or, or services from a, a competitor until this contract is up. What if someone volunteered? What if, a, what if a, a, a mother or a father of a player volunteered to come do it? Would they not be able to come out on the sideline and volunteer? Well, I would say as long as that mother or father were doing it strictly on a voluntary basis and they're not a competitive Oshner, we're fine. Um, I think the target is really here more dealing with official competitors of Oshner, but we can get clarification on that. Yeah, let's let's uh, I mean, look, nobody else may care about this. I don't know. It's not a big deal. It's sixty thousand dollars. But if it inhibits us in any way from raising additional revenues from other ways, if it uh, it creates a competitive disadvantage, I think we ought to look at it. Yeah, I'll get I'll get the board some answers before the next meeting. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice President uh, Howard. Thank you, Mrs. Hatman. Uh, Ms. Bernard. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Um, was an RFP or RFQ issued on this contract, Mr. Shamlin? Do you know, or does Ms. Williamson know? I don't believe. Uh, I don't believe an RFP or RFQ was issued with regard to this contract. Um, this is a. This is a. And it's my understanding, this is a contract for professional services, which does not necessarily require that, uh, per my procurement right. director's advice. 
right? Um, it's optional. Uh, we did not do that for this particular agreement. I'm just wondering if there is a list of um, of other providers who provide the same same or similar services, and if we shouldn't um, give everybody the opportunity to participate in the RFQ Q or RFP process. Um, and how you may have already said this, how many years have we had this contract with them? And and what give me a little bit of the history of the origins of the contract. They came to us. I think Miss Williamson might be able to speak to that a little more than me. This was before my time as general counsel. We've, we've had a, an agreement with them my entire time in this seat. And I know sometime before that, um, when I was communications director, I know that we had an agreement with them. So at least three years. But I'll let Ms. Wishman speak uh, to, to the history of the contract because it goes back quite a deal further than that. Yes, uh, two years ago, we were tr we've been trying to get the athletic trainers to service our students. And so Oshner approached us and, um, you know, the, uh, Mr. Rutledge looked over the contract. It was signed by Mr. Drake, and we've had great service from Oshner. Um, no one's approached us before this year, and you know that they, they gave us first three athletic trainers for uh, twenty thousand dollars a piece. Then they added an additional one for fifteen thousand a piece, all totaling sixty thousand, and then twelve thousand for five now, and they're hoping to get one more. So the cost will still be 60,000, just uh, increase in number of athletic trainers, certified athletic trainers. Did I answer your question? And we can look at other options, but um, mm -hmm. go ahead. My, my other question is, do they, what forms of medical insurance do they accept? Because I would think that if a, uh, player were hurt on the field, that there would be a very strong likelihood that they might go to one of their network doctors. And um, and so that's another reason that I'm asking. I think we should be competitive in Baton Rouge and I think we should, I think we should um, offer the same thing to all the provider groups. I mean, there's probably a group at Baton Rouge Orthopedic Clinic is one group. I think there are groups at the lake. I know that the lake, I believe the facility itself and most of their provider groups that are managed by their groups, they do accept uh, Medicare and I think Medicaid also. Wait, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. They accept Medicaid and I think they accept Medicare also, but it would be important that they accept those um, because some students might need a provider who accepts both of those or either of those. I had a conversation with Oshner yesterday and they do uh, accept all forms of insurance. Okay, so they're in network then for Medicaid. Yes. yes. Okay, and, and are there other providers who provide sa the same and similar services who? I will look into that for you by, okay. this, by the end of this week. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bernard. Um, we will now move to Ms. Dyson. Thank you. Um, so I, I also want to make sure that this language, if we're going to be excluding the one high school, I want to make sure that we also exclude them from anything about advertising or anything in and so when we talk about the school system agreeing and all, let's just make sure the contract is explicit that they're not going to come and put banners up at no charge to the athletic teams. That's how they make money at Woodlawn is by selling advertisements. So I don't if Woodlawn's not going to be included, then it needs to not be included in any way as far as any restrictions at all either. So I just want to make sure the wording is such that if we're not going to participate at one school or be provided, then we're not going to participate at all in any of the language. We'll check into that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dyson. Our next comment, Mr. Lannis. 
Yes, Mr. Williamson and the Attorney Chairman, I'll be real quick. Uh, is this only for sports training? This is not for any medical service that will be rendered. Right? This is only for watch over the kids. Uh, also, uh, as you said before, uh, the physicals, if they do happen to get injured while they're on the field, they're looking over the students, correct? So it's not simply training, correct? Uh, you, you went in and out, but I think I understood you. Um, yes, they provide free physicals for every student athlete uh, in, in the, at the high school level. They, if someone gets injured, usually there's a, I mean, there's always an athletic trainer uh, at the games, but there's also a physician that provides care as well, and they get them in the next day uh, to see a, a doctor or a specialist. Did okay. I answer your question, Mr. Yeah, Adams? Yeah. I, I was just clarifying because I heard some of the comments and it kind of seemed as though some people may think that there's some type of medical services that they're actually getting when it's actually a training that they're providing and also they're providing free services in the midst of giving those uh, those trainings out. And I also wanted to just lift them up also. And uh, Attorney Shellman, you can uh, second this. Uh, we do services and business with other uh, medical facilities as well. One of which would be the Baton Rouge General Hospital. We just entered into an MOU with them, with uh, one of our high schools, a local high school. So we do work with other people in other capacities. I just want to put that out there and not say, I didn't want it to, to come across like we're just pushing Ashna forward. We work with other facilities and other capacities as well. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Lannis. Mr. Tatman. Thank you, Vice President Howard. Um, just to address the point, I didn't think they were doing that either, but the comments that came in talked about ruptured Achilles tendons, torn ACLs, and they were talking about Ashner. So I I, you know, I wouldn't have thought that either. I mean, you know, my I was an athlete. They didn't have athletic trainers back then, but my son was and he worked with one. But when they started talking about broken bones and ruptured tendons and things like that, well, then that got my attention. It's one of the things that got my attention because athletic trainer services, that's way outside of the scope that they're allowed by law. And then since you brought it up, let me go a little further. Bessie has some very specific rules about uh, who can be on the sidelines and who has to be on the sidelines. And so I get that Ms. Williamson um, may be working with the only vendor that could actually provide those services because there are so many schools, you know, uh, they are often playing and practicing at the same times. So I don't want this to come across again as I'm beating up Oshner, but the comments are what draw me back to a second and third bite at the apple because again, I know I wouldn't go to an athletic trainer for a ruptured Achilles tendon. I mean, and so that's what we need to, I guess, just think about. And again, it's not about Oshner. I, I believe that they may be the only vendor that has the broad capacity to provide this. Um, and so even if there was an RFP, not that I'm against that, but I'm just saying, even if there was, we might only have, uh, you know, one, uh, uh, whatever you call it, submitter, uh, because you do, you, you know, to cover 10 high schools, and you know three sports or four sports at every high school that's a lot of people and it's a lot of bodies i just want to make sure we're doing the right thing uh relative to uh what we're supposed to do as board members so i'll shut up now thank you mr tadman are there any additional questions or comments from the board all right i see no additional comments and questions from the board we have already went to the audience madam secretary please vote Mr. Blue. Yes. Mr. Lannis. Yay. Mr. Howard. Yes. Ms. Collins. Ms. Yay. Collins. Okay. Yay. Ms. Ware Jackson. Yes. Ms. Dyson. Ms. Dyson. Yes. Mr. Godet. Ms. Bernard. Yes. Mr. Tatman. Abstain. 
just uh, clear, just to be clear, Ms. Uh, Orman, um, Mr. Godet recused himself from this item, but the motion carries. Our next item. I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. Sorry about that. Um, our next item, Ms. Orman, did you hear me? Did you hear my uh, response? I did. And Mr. Godet, um, you abstained on um, board docs. Do you want to abstain or recuse? I want to recuse. I'm sorry. OK. Thank you, Ms. Armand. Thank you, Mr. Godet. Our next item for consideration is the uh, memorandum of understanding for pre-K. Is a consideration of a request for the approval of a memorandum of understanding between the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board Lead Agency and Select Center Partners via the following grants. Preschool Development Pro Grant PDG for the expansion of three-year-old program with a per pupil allocation of $5,780.04, not to exceed $450,843.12. The LA4 Cecil JP card grant to participate in the annual Pre-K-4 program with a per pupil allocation of $4,580, not to exceed $458,000. So and moved. Not, so moved by Mr. Tadman, second by Mr. Lannis. Are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, we will move to questions and com or comments from the audience. I will refresh the board comment sheet. There is one comment from James Finney. Although I support early childhood education, I wish it was delivered at public institutions that are a part of the East Baton Rouge Parish School System. In particular, I oppose the use of this grant to encourage families to choose Impact Charter when they will be better served by starting out and remaining in a school operated by the East Baton Rouge Parish School System. That is our only public comment related to this item. We will move back to the board for any additional questions or comments. I do see two board members in the queue. Um, first up is Ms. Ware Jackson. Ms. Collins, you're next. Uh, I'm glad to see that these are additional seats, right? Uh, not something that we're just renewing. Um, that's great that we're adding uh, 79 new um, pre-K-3 seats and, and uh, about 100 pre-K-4. Uh, I have just a couple of questions. I'm wondering how the sites are chosen and then whether um, I see one of them, I think it's Little Dreamers, has no pre-K-4 and only uh, pre-K-3. Is it that they already have funding for pre-K-4? I'm just wondering about the continuity there and how we choose the, um, the sites. Mr. Smith. Good evening, board members. This is Shanoa Webb. Um, I'm glad um, to answer your questions. Um, based on the data analysis with the LDOE, it was indicated that our three-year-old children were not accessing high-quality um, child care services. So that's why we target a three-year-old um, grant to expand classes and child care centers. They were selected um, based on a rubric, but also if the child care centers had a high proficient rating or higher, um, if the site had the capacity to accept and expand their three-year-old classes, and if they had active participation in our network. And so based on that, um, that's how we selected those sites. Little Dreamers, um, they only go up to three-year-old um, because of their capacity, but they are also thinking about expanding at, at some point. Mm -hmm. OK, all right. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Ward Jackson. Um, next in the queue is Ms. Collins. Uh, yes, when I was uh, looking at this agenda item, I was uh, talking with uh, I, I reached out to legal counsel and I would just like for him to uh, help uh, people understand this particular item and share uh, what he had explained to me about the nature of uh, us doing this legally. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Mr. Chairman. Yes, and, and Mr. Smith might be just as capable as me to explain this part because he's, he's kind of immersed himself in this. Um, but in 2012, the Louisiana legislature passed the Early Childhood Care and Education Act 
which requires uh, Bessie to unify publicly funded preschool, Head Start and child care programs into a statewide network. Um, and this is so that families would have easy access to high quality pre-K programming. Um, there are about 65 statewide networks or lead agencies. EBR serves as one of those lead agencies. Um, therefore, we are responsible for conducting administrative functions um, for that community network. This includes serving as the fiscal agent, which I believe, uh, and our other personnel can speak to this, what we're actually doing here being the fiscal agent for grants, but more importantly, coordinating the birth to age five child count. So this is basically a, a requirement of the law, um, and it requires us to act and to do certain things in a certain way. I'll let Mr. Smith jump in to give some, maybe some of the details that I'm missing, um, but this is basically a legal requirement, and, and we're required to operate this way. Mr. Shamblin, you, you've answered all the questions correctly. This is a sort of pass-through. Uh, it's on a reimbursement. Uh, it's a standard MOU that we've been doing for the past few years with some of our uh, partners that are in our network. Uh, uh, and so basically our pre-K department, they make sure that the uh, partners are following the uh, guidelines as it relates to uh, the grant funding and uh, it's on a per pupil allocation and uh, they seek reimbursement through the district. We are just a fiscal agent. OK, so it's not that we've awarded to those. It's not that, OK, we chose that we chose, EBR chose uh, facility so-and-so. Correct, uh, they, they, make, they make application to us. They're entitled to the funding uh, through Act 3, uh, that legislative uh, law that passed in 2012. And so uh, this is the, one of the initiative of, um, of the state, early childhood learning uh, from birth to, uh, birth to four, four year olds. And so uh, uh, the centers that you, you see before us uh, we've had standard MOUs before uh, even this one that we re renew. And I, I imagine, and this is taking the uh, question to another level, uh, still related, but um, I, I imagine this Act 3 funding is relatively limited. Um, I, I, I lift that up because I'm trying to process for myself. Uh, most of us, I'm sure all of us on the board uh, would appreciate all of our school sites being able to offer pre-K three, uh, please excuse me, pre-K three uh, or, or even earlier um, educational services on all of our elementary school sites. And so then my question is, um, it, this is not the, the, the pot of money for this is not large enough for us to use to draw that down or, or what is it that would pre prevent us? What, what is it that would prevent? What is it that would prevent um, Park Forest Elementary, for example, stop, you stop. Park Forest Elementary, for example, from drawing down this Act 3 funding or does yeah. anything prevent it? Well, it would be quite costly for the district, uh, Ms. Collins, to add three-year-olds to our uh, our facilities. I think it was mentioned earlier about the YMCA adding, having to go through licensing, and quite often sometimes uh, it would require uh, retrofitting facilities, modifying facilities to meet that licensing standards. Uh, we actually had to go through with two of our school um, was it Belfair and Dufrock, where we had to go through a licensing process and we had to ha actually pay some additional funds to kind of retrofit those facilities. I'm sorry, Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, you're muted. Once you started talking, I did remember that that was an issue for um, Belfair and Dufrock. So, uh, and, and so then the Act 3 funding wouldn't be sufficient to help mitigate the cost. Nope. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Uh, the yes. grant money is only per pupil allocation and the cost for ref retrofitting uh, facilities will be on the burden of the district. OK. All right. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Thank you, uh, Mr. Smith and others um, for your input. 
Um, the board is clear. Um, I will go check the, I think, have I been to the audience? Yes, I have been to the audience. Um, so, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue? Yes. Mr. Lannis? Yay. Mr. Howard? Yes. Ms. Collins? Yay. Ms. Ware Jackson? Yes. Ms. Dyson? Ms. Dyson? Ms. Dyson, can you give us your verbal vote? Yes. Mr. Godet? Yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Mr. Tatman? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Our next item for consideration is a policy and provisions item number D7. It is a consideration of request for the approval of the following school board policies, policy, school board policies slash policy revisions in related matters. JAAA Title IX Grievance Procedures, JCEA Student Sexual Misconduct, GAMC Investigations, GAEAA Sexual Harassment, GAAA Equal Opportunity Employment, and GAE Complaints and Grievances. This has been brought to us by Mr. Shamlin. At this time, I entertain a motion. So moved by Mr. Tapman, second by Ms. Collins. Um, we have a motion in a second, and the board, there's one in person in the queue, Ms. Dyson. Mr. Shamlin, can you just uh, go through on each one very briefly what the changes in our policy will mean? Yes, ma'am. Well, rather than going through each one individually, that might take a little bit of time. Um, I'll give you kind of a broad overview. Um, we are essentially adopting and amending a mix of policies to make sure that we are aligned uh, with Title IX regulations and rule changes from the federal government level. Okay, we're essentially adopting three new policies. Title VII, they're not new, but they are new in replacing other policies we currently had. We had Title VII, employee sexual harassment, Title IX, sexual harassment, and also sexually related student misconduct. Um, the previous student sexual harassment policy had been revised and retitled as a sexually relate as sexually related student misconduct and a new comprehensive Title IX sexual harassment policy. This new policy provides several things. Um, it requires policy notice that the school board does not discriminate on the basis of sex in its education programs or activities. This has to be placed at our website and in other places uh, and in other locales provides for new definitions as used in the new regulations uh, provided by the federal government, um, <clears throat> provides for the appointment of a Title IX coordinator, which we have always had in place, um, but it now is officially required um, to lead school board efforts to comply with the new regulations, including training and publication information. So we'll be rolling out efforts to provide training for staff in the next month um, on these new approaches and new processes. Um, it requires a response to actual knowledge of sexual harassment, including developing what we would call supportive measures for both the accused and the accuser, um, investigation procedures and grievance procedures, um, their requirements around record keeping provisions, meaning the requirements of Title IX sexual harassment documents be maintained for a period of now seven years, um, and then new retaliation and confidentiality provisions as required by regulations, basically prohibiting uh, retaliation in any way against an accused or uh, against an accuser. Uh, because Title IX sexual harassment is now addressed separately, we have now the employee sexual harassment policy, which has been revised to limit its scope to prohibitions in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So we're amending our employee sexual harassment policy to comply with Title VII, which generally applies to employees and others in the workplace. And it has been renamed accordingly. We're also revising um, policies related to equal opportunity employment, non-Title IX complaints and grievances. These are complaints unrelated to Title IX in any kind of way, but they're still vital and need to be investigated by HR department uh, and investigations to make sure that they reflect all Title IX sexual harassment complaints and uh, that they're being addressed under Title IX sexual harassment policies and procedures. So essentially, we are realigning our policies with new ones 
and with amending old ones to make sure we comply with the law. The biggest change will be uh, that we now need to do some additional notices to the public in different places and more importantly training staff and you know district staff and school staff in the proper ways to investigate report and investigate uh, complaints that that's the big one um, and I anticipate rolling something out in conjunction with HR and Andrew Davis our title nine coordinator over the next month to make sure we're in compliance and you guys should be getting information on that as well I'll be sure we loop the board in on those communications and so um, does this in any way change the ability to have this once proven as a zero tolerance offense? No, ma'am. From a student? By from a student? student perspective, no, ma'am. No, what changes are some of the processes of investigation and yeah. the required supports to students on both sides, both the accused and the accuser during the investigation. Yes, yes, ma'am. OK, but it, it would remain a zero tolerance offense once if it was proven. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Shamlin. Um, the board is now clear. We will go to public comment. All right, we have a few comments related to um, this particular item. So I will start on um, D7. The first comment is from Jan, Ch Jan Chandler. Policy GAE AA sexual harassment page two. The form to report a complaint of sexual har harassment should be accessible on the EBR um, parish website so that victims don't have to request it in person. The next comment is from Anne Marie Blank. Regarding the sexual harassment policy, in the interest of accessibility, PSN would like to see an accessible online version that can be re can be printed and turned in electronically. A victim should not be required to go to the central office to access this form, especially considering how spread out our district is. Victims must be afforded the privacy of printing the document in their own home and filling it out in private. Ultimately, we like to see an increase in accessibility of documents and information concerning the process. Colleen Kiesel, how will the attendance policy, section, attendance policy section two, item 13, be updated to reflect virtual schooling and the problems that will pop up with internet access, especially for the older students who, according to release schedules, will be required to check in for each class period. I know the board has been working to get access to internet for all families, but streaming speeds could be a problem if multiple family member children are trying to use computers at the same time. Our powers have our power has gone out periodically this summer due to line work. If this happens over multiple days, would students risk truancy problems just for missing a couple of days of check in? Coronda Curley. Um, we, the members of the Step Up Louisiana Parent Union, stand in agreement with your newly anti-discrimination hiring and termination practice policy for EBR power school system employees. However, after careful review of your sexual harassment and grievance Title VII and Title IX policy, we became troubled. We noticed these policies did not address reporting the investigation for children with disabilities. Considering EBR parish school system has a large population of children who are nonverbal, American Sign Language, ASL, and the English language learners, we believe these policies should have included mandated reporters, such as the Department of Child and Family Services and Banner's Children Advocacy Center. We also note the policy does not reflect a third party or unbiased entity that could or would be responsible for taking these reports, conducting the investigation, and conclusion. These policies also lack the details of the elastic time frame in which the entire process should be completed with the next steps. That concludes our public comments on this agenda item. I will now return back to the board. Are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue. Yes. Mr. Lannis. Yay. Mr. Howard. Yes. Ms. Collins? Yes. Ms. Collins? Ms. Ward Jackson? Yes. Ms. Dyson? Yes. Mr. Godet? Yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Mr. Tapman? Mr. Tapman? Yes. The motion yes. carries. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
And Mr. Uh, Shanlon, before we move to the next item, I know we already cast a vote, but I do want to um, get with you after this to talk about that online forum because I think that it was a valid um, point brung up about the, the access to it so that people won't feel like they have to come and show and identify themselves in the process of uh, being, you know, victims of sexual assault or, or misconduct. So I'll, I'll get with you after this to discuss that. Yes, sir. And this is a requirement of the law that it be placed online. So we, well, I'd be glad to discuss it with you, but I agree. We'll take okay. care of that. Thank you. Um, our next item for consideration is contracts charter. This is a consideration for the request for the approval of the contract between East Baton Rouge Parish School Board and the following HCS, HCS Baton Rouge, Helix Aviation School Operators, HES Baton Rouge Mentorship Legal Academy Operators. Uh, Mr. Shamley, would you want to give a brief understanding of what's happening with these contracts? Yes, um, I now I'm recommending the approval of two contracts with HCS Baton Rouge as Helix Schools. Those schools are Helix Aviation Academy and Mentorship Legal Academy. Um, HCS Baton Rouge was authorized as a charter operator of Helix Aviation Academy and the Legal Academy back on May 9, 2019, so that's last year. Um, these contracts uh, set the necessary parameters and define the legal relationship between the board and the operator as required by law. Um, uh, sometime back, the board, I think, expressed um, the intent to bring these contracts Back for approval. Mr. Shamlin, before you start, I did not uh, receive the motion, motion, so it's moved by Mr. I, Jackson, and I will second the motion. You can continue. I won't start over. Is that okay, Mr. Yeah, Howard? That's okay. <laughs> um, and so um, the, these contracts basically uh, set the parameters for the legal relationship between the board and the operator as required by law. Um, it's important to note, and there was some confusion last uh, month with basis that these are not an approval of new charter schools. Um, this is merely uh, putting contracts in place to to, um, to codify the current relationship that we have already approved. The board's already approved last year, um, and I will take any questions at that at this point. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, I will go to public comments. Is a couple of comments related to this item. Karanda Curley, considering the current situation with COVID-19, I believe EBR Parish Schools should revisit and eliminate these con charter contracts. Due to social distancing, the Helix Aviation School would not be able to practice social distancing while simultaneously teaching children how to work or nor fly an aircraft. Mentorship legal schools should be eliminated considering EBR Parish Schools has three schools, Scotlandville Magnet, Bel Air High, and Scotlandville Middle, which has this program. What will allow a charter? What will mentorship legal do different? Nothing. EBR Parish Schools has three wonderful schools within the equivalent program. If not better, again, why would we approve and allow a charter to expand without the consideration? Are you considering the exclusion of children with disabilities from these charters? Are we considering the exclusion of English language learners from these charters? We do not want to be included in litigation against them. I believe we, EBR Parish School Systems, have the opportunity to correct the wrong and eliminate these charter contracts. James Finney, these contracts lack any teeth to protect the public when charter schools fail to abide by their contractual obligations. Since neither school anticipates operation until August 2021, at the soonest, it will be worth revising the template contract to be much clearer on what happens when a school is in the breach of contract, what happens to the facilities bought with public money, when the school closes, and what happens when a contract expires and a subsequent contract is not successfully negotiated and executed. That concludes the public. Um, Public comments related to this item. I'll return back to the board. Are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue? Yes. Mr. Lannis? Yay. Mr. Howard? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Collins? Yay. Ms. Ward Jackson? Yes. Ms. Dyson? Yes. Mr. Godet? Mr. Godet? Yes. Yes. Ms. Bernard? Yes. Mr. Chapman? Yes. The motion carries. The motion carries. Our last item for consideration is our student rights and responsibilities handbook and discipline policy. It is a consideration of the request for the approval of the Student Rights and Responsibilities hand Handbook and Discipline Policy for the 2020-2021 school year for the East Baton Rouge Parish School System with noted changes. Mr. Shamlin, if you would like to give a brief presentation related to the changes or just a brief overview of the process. I'll, I'll move, Mr. Vice President. 
Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Tapman. And so moved by Mr. Tapman, and I will second um, that motion. Mr. Shamlin. Yes, um, I, I won't take much time. Uh, as you know, every time around this time every year, the board considers for approval student rights responsibilities handbook, which sets in place rules and regulations for students, parents, and and everyone involved in the education process going forward. Um, I will apologize uh, somewhat because normally this is brought to the board in July, uh, but due to the COVID-19 situation and the delay in legislation from the state level, we were unable to do that. So this is as soon as we could get it to you guys for approval. Um, I will say that uh, we will be distributing the handbook uh, electronically to all uh, students as soon as the board approves this in two weeks. Um, and there'll be a digital um, process by which parents can sign for receipt of the handbook. We'll also print hard copies for those who would like to take a hard copy home. Um, my, my memo basically speaks to some of the changes. We convened the committee as required by law, the discipline review committee comprised of a mixture of educators, parents, teachers, um, a board member, I believe Mr. Howard and a few others. Um, and so the changes were all considered uh, by recommendations from district personnel and parents, brought to the committee for discussion, voted upon in a formal meeting. So the the recommendations you've received come from directly from that committee, um, and this is the same process we put in place every year. I'll take any questions on the on the rights and responsibilities handbook um, going forward, but I seek approval from the board so that we can move forward. Yeah, so I'll ask. Um, I have a maybe one question specifically. Um, well, two questions. The first question is, is surrounding our uh, zero tolerance policy. Um, and I know there was some mention made of it um, as we talked about the sexual harassment and all of those different things. But I mean, there's tons of research out there that talks about the, the disadvantage that zero tolerance policy gives to students, specifically minority students. Um, so I don't really know what the process is for us to, to revisit, review, and, and rethink the quote unquote zero tolerance policy. Um, there is some um, some error in the policy as a collective systemic issue. Um, and so I would ask that we revisit our zero tolerance policy specifically around like some things that could be misinterpreted. Um, we know the law is very um, gray and not black and white as people would like to make it seem sometime. So I think that there is problems with our um, handbook still indicating that we follow quote unquote a zero tolerance policy. And then the second um, notion that I would to, like to raise is surrounding now that we are experiencing school in a virtual setting in a virtual environment for this for a majority of the sector of times. I've seen some schools put out some very problematic um, communication to families around how they will be enforcing tardies, how they will be enforcing uniform policies. And I don't know if the handbook really provides an exclusionary um, provision around when we find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic and how schools are allowed to, um, to, to I guess, quote unquote, reprimand or uh, practice discipline policies. Um, so I know that you know we'll probably approve this today, but I do want us to revisit and talk about um, our zero tolerance policy as a collective, um, and then talk about like how do we make provisions related to schooling in a COVID pandemic world. And Mr. Lannis. Yes, yeah, just real quickly, I think that my sentiments are the same as Vice President Howard around uh, zero tolerance as it regards student discipline. Uh, there has been several uh, pieces of data and sources of data that has come out and show that there are several inconsistencies in that policy. And what I would like to do is one, I want to, I definitely want to be a part of those conversations, but two, I would love to see us implement or uh, create some where we have more restorative practices inside of those processes rather than being very punitive on the front end i would love to make sure that we are looking at our students and finding uh new innovative ways to reach them on a restorative practice level so thank you uh, i just wanted to chime in and say the same thing that you know uh myself and uh, my colleagues have uh, discussed this and, and expressed this concern uh, several times over and so i look forward to us um, finding a meaningful way to actually uh, implement some change uh, i do agree um, in particular with the restorative justice uh, models that are out there uh, as my colleagues have already expressed zero tolerance uh, policies are proven not to be uh, 
effective at all. Well, not at all, but it is not the most effective by any means and have been proven to be detrimental to um, uh, ch children of color in particular. Uh, the research also shows that, um, um, ironically, um, uh, it's children of color who tend to have these zero tolerance policies more so than others. Uh, and so then I, I look forward to us uh, doing some meaningful work uh, to make some changes on that. Thank you. Mr. Howard, I think you're muted. Sorry, Mr. Goday. Thank you, Vice President Howard. Uh, just one quick comment. Uh, I'm going to vote for this and we can move on, but I wanted to uh, ask Mrs. Brown and the staff, uh, you know, in the last meeting we passed a resolution to start, uh, and one of that was to start looking at all policies and procedures for possible uh, areas where we need to improve to have uh, so we don't have this disproportionate racial impact on our from our policies and procedures and I would just like to make sure that we get started with that process that sometime the next month or two I know we have lots of things on our plate but start outlining a process about how we would go about doing that within the staff and within with community input uh, so that I realize that process is going to take time and it's going to need to flow back to the board probably in pieces but uh, I just wanted to remind everyone that we do have the commitment to start that process and that we need to have it on on the work list for, for staff to figure out how we're going to start doing that. I know it's another item on a long work list, but it's an important one that I think we need to go to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godet. Uh, Ms. Ward Jackson. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Vice President Howard. I just wanted to share with you that um, that we have been meeting already on taking a look at how we integrate uh, some of the language of that resolution into our policy and aligning our practices into policy to make sure that those things are met. It is going to take us a little time, but uh, but we believe that we have some criteria and things to look at to make sure that we're measuring um, and really taking a look at, at that uh, situation in particular, making sure that we have uh, measurable objectives to meet in uh, meeting equity. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, Ms. Ward Jackson. Thank you, Vice President Howard. Um, thank you, President Godet and um, Mrs. Brown for addressing that. Uh, I, th I think a lot of people are were probably thinking about that. You know, the resolution that we just passed. I'm glad to hear that. You know, we're we'll we'll be moving forward with that soon. And um, Mr. Uh, Shamlin, I'm wondering if you know, for the last couple of years, we've gotten a lot of input from. Um, a particular group, um, um, the the ones that are from Metromorphosis, um, and I'm wondering if any of those suggestions have been integrated into the the new handbook. Do we have anything new that's been integrated from those conversations? That I'm you're not aware. Of? Yes, I'm not aware of anything specifically. Every recommendation sent to me is gen generally this year. Everything was sent via email, um, mm -hmm. and I always ask. Um, persons to submit in writing their request. I bring those two um, directly to the, the DRC, the, to the, the review committee for discussion and for a vote on whether it to be included or not. So mm -hmm. I, I can't say specifically whether anything came from that particular group, but I can check for you. But every recommendation brought to me, I brought to the DRC and it was discussed. Mm -hmm. and I think the minutes um, have been attached for you guys to review as well. So you can see the discussion and what was talked about. Um, but I'll say this going forward, we can spend the year for sure, uh, Mr. Howard and others, um, exploring ideas and, and making recommendations. I begin taking recommendations day one for the next year. So mm -hmm. if you have ideas um, or suggestions, send them to me. I'll log them and make sure that they get submitted to the committee timely. Uh, and we'll make sure that those discussions happen. Great. OK, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Ms. Blair Jackson, Mr. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Shamlin. Mr. Ballou. OK, um, seeing no additional questions or comments from the audience, if Mr. Ballou, if your mic comes back on, you can come back after we go to the audience. I will load the board comments. Um, we have a few comments related to this item. Jan Chandler, I recommend that after the vision and mission statement that you include the resolution on commitment to equity and eradicating racism, the important document should not live in a drawer, but should be used to set the tone for the entire school system and be communicated to parents and students who are the very ones most affected by the overriding policy. Colleen Keisel, hello, could you clarify section four, item one, which states students will wear a face mask that is <clears throat> free of any offensive words, initials, or designs. I should read, I should, should that read free of offensive words, official initials or offensive designs or all designs or mask bands, i.e. cartoon or animal face masks for kids, or is it being decided on a school by school basis? Also, what's their review process to update the handbook? It was released as part of the agenda two days ago and many parents will not have the time to read the whole thing in order to make public comments at this meeting. First off, we must put out that handbook is a 78 page document that was posted 48 hours before this meeting. The public does not have the time to review this document. Was community input gathered as it is or for the policy items? Currently, the handbook says nothing about the inclusion or equity, especially considering we had just had the equity resolution. Students have a right to learn in a racist free environment. We would love to see the entirety of the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board commitment to equity and eradicating res racism resolution in the handbook. Additionally, individual schools create their own student grooming and discipline codes. This needs to be reviewed consistently for racial biases and codes and should be adjusted immediately. If they have racially biased disciplinary practices in the interest of the following equity resolution, please put together an ad hoc committee, parents, students, teachers, stakeholders, and begin reviewing the handbook for compliance. And uh, Andy Laurie, extremely concerned about the students for children doing virtual learning. Um, I would love the minutes per year day be suspended. Did this happen when the governor extended our state of emergency? Thanks. The draft states, <clears throat> Charles Lee, the draft states students who are attending school in a virtual setting will be required to follow the established school uniform policies and practices. Some schools are allowing students to follow free dress, where many high poverty schools are mandating uniforms for virtual learning. What does that mean? Please waive uniform requirements for virtual learning. Kids have been through enough, and this is not trauma informed policy. Pray that they make it, pray that they make it if at all. If they wear, if they want to wear uniforms, great. If not, great. Me, families, and kids where they are now, rather than mandating they wear uniforms for virtual learning, show a touch of compassion. Y'all need to chuck the chuck the world, Karen Brissett. Y'all need to chuck the world thing and start the whole thing and start over. Send this to the recycling bin. The discipline policies are dated and rooted in anti-blackness. Start over and end racism in EBR schools. Marcy Frazier, as a petition captain calling for the school. Recalling a school board member for demonstrating behavior on becoming of a board member due to potential criminal charges. I find that zero tolerance needs to be addressed across the board. How are we going to hold students to a higher expectation than we do board members? It is our responsibility as adults to set the example we expect to see from kids. If can't expect from Connie, how can we from the children? Connie Colin Cassell, end of the media note. Can the school board move in the future to have a staff member read public comment instead of the board member leading the meeting? That way all board members can be actively listening to the comments instead of having a board member trying to interpret any misspellings or grammar issues while reading. Also, Leon, question, where did Tadman get where did Tadman get the line? Can I request that board members have less distracting backgrounds in the future? Jasmine Pogue, PSN would like to suggest in addition to the student handbook that addresses racism, students have a right to learn in a racist free environment. The responsibility of the student is students have the responsibility to be open to learn about racism and internalize racist bias that may, that may hold and work to address those biases when they come up. Currently, the handbook says nothing about inclusion or equity, especially considering we just had an equity resolution. We would also like to include the entirety of the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board commitment to equity and eradicating resolution, racism resolution in the handbook. We also would like to suggest the board put together an ad hoc committee, parents, students, teachers, stakeholders, and begin reviewing the handbook by September. Individual school student grooming and discipline policies could be reviewed consistently for racial bias and codes should be adjusted immediately if shown to have racially shown outcomes based on discipline. That concludes the public comment. Um, we will return back to the board. Mr. Ballou, do you still have your question? Yes, uh, just real quick for uh, Mr. Shamlin. 
And regarding the issue of zero tolerance, uh, how much discretion does the state give us? And are, are there any uh, actions where we don't have discretion uh, as far as the uh, uh, punishment? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I understand your question, but uh, each district is free to set rules and regulations um, as it as it sees fit. OK, well, that, that answers my question. Then. Yeah, Mr. So we, we have full discretion then. Yes, Mr. That, Chairman, that's correct. OK, Mr. Thanks. Chairman, I think there are some issues as it relates to guns and weapons. OK, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Smith. As it okay. relates to guns and weapons, I think there are there are some state laws around guns and weapons. Well, yeah, cer certainly any any behavior that, and I guess I, I didn't think along those lines, but any behavior related to potential criminal outcomes, th th there's no, you've got very little room to operate because there's criminal requirements there, right? Um, there are potential punishments that, that can become, come from the behavior at the criminal level. But we're talking about rules and regulations for students in schools broadly, and we do have flexibility to operate as a general rule to, to put in place what we need um, to meet the needs of our, our district. Thank you, right, Mr. Thank you. Um, oh, Mr. Ballou, continue. No, that, that was it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ballou. Thank you, Mr. Shamlin. Um, I do, uh, Ms. Brown um, and, and others, I do really think that we need to take a, um, a closer look at the some of the schools and, and their own individual communication around their um, their COVID related policies related to, to to discipline. I mean, I saw one school and I was I was almost um, embarrassed that it even went out publicly, just the way that everything just seems so punitive for kids in, in a setting that we find ourselves in. And so like, I think that over the next week or so, as we um, integrate back into schools um, and students start to show up to the virtual environment, that it's it's our due diligence as a, as a, as a system, as a board, as, as administration to really consider what some schools are, are communicating and narrating to our families related to how punitive, like literally, tardies are as it relates to like a virtual environment when some of the le lectures are going to be re recorded there's going to be different work schedules it's just going to be a different world and so to try to operate your virtual school the same way you m operate your um your your brick and mortar school i think is a gross misconduct and so i think that we have to be very intentional about how we allow schools to punish kids we already have a very um, high suspension rate and exposure rate specifically for minority students, but to, to utilize a virtual um, virtual environment to, to still try to keep up some of those same practice is I think an extreme gross misconduct and I think that's something that we really should pay close attention to and revisit. So just wanted to uplift that um, into the atmosphere as we have this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, I will recognize Mr. Lannis for a point of personal privilege. I can speak actually on this item, Vice President Howard, because my comment has nothing to do with this item, but we can close this item out. OK, um, Madam Secretary. Please vote. Mr. Blue. Yes. Mr. Lannis. Yay. Mr. Howard. Um, I'll be abstain abstaining from this item so that we can talk about the COVID related uh, issues in the handbook. Ms. Collins. Yay. Ms. Ware Jackson. Yes. Ms. Dyson. Yes. Mr. Goday. Yes. Ms. Bernard. Yes. Mr. Tatman. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. The motion carries. Mr. Lannis, uh, your point of personal privilege. Yes, sir. Thank you, Vice President Howard. I just wanted to give a brief update on donations made thus far for Liberty High School signage. Uh, as it is today, we have received two major uh, pledges, one of which from New Schools Baton Rouge for $50,000. Uh, which was sent out to Ms. Kathleen Sarsfield, our Executive Director of East Baton Rouge Parish uh, Foundation. 
Another one from CSRS for $5,000, which came, uh, they sent that pledge out today again to Miss uh, Kathleen Sarsfield. And when you include that with the $540 from the 12 donors that we already had collectively, we have raised $55,540 thus far to go towards signage for Liberty High School. And I uh, also want to make a comment why it is while we encourage our entire community to give as much as they can, and if you do have the means to give, we definitely encourage you to, please check out uh, foundationebr.org. Again, that is foundationebr.org. As soon as you get on the webpage, which you will see a huge link that says donate, and you can donate as much uh, as you can, or as much as you believe that you want to. But again, my point is that while we encourage our entire community to help out with this endeavor, it is not required they do not have a requirement to do so and i think at some point we will have to revisit this as a school board to see how much we'll be contributing towards this as well but that is my update on the signage again fifty-five thousand five hundred and forty dollars that have been donated thus far to go to a sign for liberty high school thank you thank you um mr lannis at this time we will go to our last item and it is a announcement of meetings our regular school board meeting will be held on august 20th 2020 at 5 o'clock p.m our other location to be determined the committee of the whole meeting will be on september 3rd 2020 at 5 o'clock p.m the location is to be determined and at this moment i move that we adjourn this meeting